Okay, we're back to resume this lecture on spirituality and stress. So I want to look at how spirituality and religion affect health. And of course, nobody knows this for sure, but there are some theories. So I want to kind of walk into that a little bit. Um, so there's something called the control theory. And basically it states that when somebody feels some degree of control over a stressor, then that person's health will be less affected by the stressor. And we kind of talked about this earlier in the semester when we talked about just stress in general and how when there's, um, you know, some degree of predictability, that seems to be better. So this is kind of um, talking to that point a little bit. So when you, when somebody feels some degree of control versus somebody who perceives little or no control, their health is going to be less affected if they do feel some degree of control. So um, there's kind of two approaches to increasing control. One is referred to as primary control. Primary control is very similar to like problem-focused problem coping strategies. So with primary control, there's an attempt to change a situation. Um, in with secondary control, uh, there's attempts to control oneself or somebody's emotional reactions, but not the situation itself. So primary control is an attempt to change a situation, and secondary control is an attempt to control oneself or one's emotional reactions. I think secondary control might be more useful in um, a situation where there's where there is very low control, like maybe like in a natural disaster or potentially like a disease or something along those lines. Um, when it comes to religion and spirituality, um, religion and spirituality can can really function as either um, a primary or a secondary control. It kind of it sort of depends. So um, if there is, let me turn the slide, change the slide here. So in terms of primary control, there's something called intercessory prayer. Um, intercessory prayer is basically when prayer is used to seek divine intervention, either to prevent an occurrence or to help overcome that occurrence. So again, the in, in this in this case, we're using um, intercessory prayer as, as a primary control activity and basically we are um, you know pray, praying for divine intervention for secondary controls examples of secondary controls are things like meditation contemplative prayer rituals scripture readings um, the objective here is to lessen the emotional reactions to stress with secondary control we're, we're really reframing the situations so as to view it as the outcome of fate or forces of nature, right? Remember, we're, we're not, with secondary control, we're not attempting to control the situation, but more, you know, getting, you know, attempt to control our reaction, essentially, to the, sec to this, to the, um, to the situation. So when we kind of look at religious approaches to increasing control, we have a religious approaches to increasing controls is kind of um, is is a sort of coping mechanism, and what we have seen is that um, well, let me go through the approaches first. So the first is is referred to as self directing. With self directing, the person perceives him or herself as responsible for the outcome. So we could say that God or nature has provided the resources that the person needs to be successful, um, but they are ultimately responsible for the outcome. That's called self-directing. Collaborative is when the person works with God to control the situation. Or we could also say works with the with forces of nature to control the situation. We don't need to necessarily 
deferring is basically when the entire situation is turned over to God or forces of nature to control the situation. So the person's kind of hands off, handing the whole thing off. That's referred to as deferring. And pleading, of course, is when the individual begs for either God or the forces of nature to intervene in the situation to resolve it. So there's been studies, surprisingly, on um, all of these approaches. And the studies have shown that, and I think this kind of makes sense, but studies have shown that self-direction and collaborative approaches tend to be associated with better mental health and um, more kind of competence. The deferring approach is associated with lower levels of self-competence, which kind of makes sense. Although I think we, you know, it, it sort of depends on the circumstance. I think we could say that either the collaborative or even the deferring approach might be helpful when somebody really doesn't have any control. Like for example, if someone's going in for a surgical procedure um, where, they, where that person really doesn't have any control of the situation. So in that case, the collaborative or the deferring sort of approach might also might actually be the healthier way to go. So I think all of this has to sort of be taken in the cons in the in the context of the situation. Um, all right. So and that so that was that's called the control theory. There's another theory called the social support theory, and of course it is well known that social support is a very effective means for managing stress and preventing also the ill effects of stress, as we've been talking about. And and actually this is an area of a lot of of research currently. Um, and in the in the context of religious religions and spiritual affiliation, um, these affiliations or these this religious sort of community oftentimes will provide a social support structure that has very profound effects on health. Right. So um, I think it's a pre I think it's it's pretty well established that social social support is a big deal. Um, so again, you know, in, in the context of religion or, or um, spirituality, when people participate, you know, in a church or they have, you know, a synagogue or whatever other spiritual group they may belong to, when they have this kind of a, this kind of a community, they're, they're in really close contact with other people that share a similar mind. And that's kind of an important piece to this. Um, and this sense of affiliation or belonging really oftentimes eases feelings of anger or and or anxiety. And I think it's important to note that social support can take on many different faces. Um, it can come in the form of emotional support. It can come in the form of financial support, or it can come in the form of information, right? There's lots of different ways that social support will show up. Um, and it kind of, again, depends on the, on the, the particular hardship that a person is is dealing with, um, and and the stress, of course, that that results from that. So I think what we're saying here with the social support theory is that this is a, um, a potentially a very good way to help to mitigate some of the effects of stress by just you know having again this feeling of of belonging and um, and a place that 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 they you know a, a group of people in in a sense of place, just so important to. All right, so that so that's the social support theory. There's another theory which I think is really interesting. It's called the placebo theory, um, and I'm sure you've all heard of a placebo before. But essentially, what the placebo theory um, says is when people believe that something is going to help them, often they report that it actually does. And the placebo effect is well known in medicine. It's well known in drug research. It's well known, you know, it, it just it, across all sorts of different arenas. And in the context of this, we're thinking, you know, about spirituality and religion, but, um, but it, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have to be isolated to that, but that's our topic at hand today. So, you know, there's lots of people that have argued that, you know, this, re these religious groups or affiliations or these spiritual activities, um, really don't have any direct effect on health. And it just, in, in fact, is the simply the placebo effect, which is, of course, if somebody believes that something will help them, it will. Um, now, the placebo effect is it's hard to it's a hard thing to um, really put your finger on, you know, and really explain why this is happening. Um, 
so it's for these reasons that that in research, um, oftentimes researchers try very hard to you know to to isolate the, this variable. And so how they do that is they set up these studies, which are called double blind studies, where basically the researchers and the people that are being that are participating in the experiment are blinded to whether or not they are the treatment group or the control group. So so nobody really knows who's getting the actual treatment or who's you know the control group. And so that's one of the ways that 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 that, that we've sort of tried to you know try to sort of ferret out this placebo theory because of people but but you know it, it still doesn't really matter because if you think you're in a group that's that's getting the treatment or if you're in the group that's getting the support or whatever then um the, the, what the placebo theory basically states is that sometimes that in and of itself it's like sort of like for lack of a better analogy the power of suggestion you know if you think it's going to help it does you know um I, my personal belief on it is who cares you know if, if, if yeah, that's great you know it, we whatever helps is awesome but um that's again another another theory on in terms of you know what's how spirituality and religions actually potentially helps so it can be because of the the um control theory that we talked about it can be because of because it provides the social support or it could just be providing the placebo but what we do see is that people who are religious and or spiritual seem to have better better health and less stress, is what we're trying to say. Why that is, who knows? Um, but that seems to be the way it comes, shakes down. All right, so I want to um, kind of, we're, we're kind of coming up on the end of this, but I, I left what I feel like is one of the most important topics for last and it is forgiveness and health and this is something that I spend a lot of time working with my patients that I work with because I find that um, this is at the heart of lots of issues for people that they've been carrying around for a really long time so I'd like you to think for a moment and imagine someone who's done something that's so harmful to you that you cannot see your way to ever forgiving them. And as you think about that, I'd like you to reflect upon how you feel when you think of that person. Do you feel angry? Um, you know, whatever you feel is perfectly natural. But after you sort of sit with that for a minute, I want you to kind of sort of, um, you know, understand if you don't already that you being so angry and unforgiving is actually unhealthy for you, right? You're the one that's being damaged as a result of this, right? It's not, your, your anger isn't likely hurting this other person. In some cases, they don't even know that that's this experience, but you, you being so angry and unforgiving is unhealthy for you. When you're angry and unforgiving or any of those feelings, those negative feelings that come up when you imagine that person or that, that um, situation, that's evoking a stress reaction that's accompanied by all of the consequences of stress that we've been talking about throughout the entire class. As a matter of fact, research has shown that forgiveness evokes brain activity that's consistent with anger, aggression, and stress. Um, along with the stress-related hormonal secretions, like especially cortisol, which we talked about before, and epinephrine, we also know that this is going to render our immune system less effective. So basically what I'm saying is, is all, all these feelings that you're carrying, and, and in many cases, these are deep, like these are wounds that have been around for a long time, and we're just not able to kind of like to let it go, right? We're not able to get back. So as you think about situations that that um, in your life that potentially bring up these kinds of emotions, I'd like to ask you now, is it worth it for you? Is it worth it? Is it, is it, is, 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 is are the effects on your body worth it? The stress related response that we know about the immune suppression, right? The stress, you know, the brain, the changes that we see in the brain as a result of chronic stress, is it really worth it? 
So, um, I'll say before I say anything else, for your own mental and physical health, you should really try to forgive, right? And it's I know it's easy to say, and it's not always easy to do. But one way to learn to forgive is to recognize that that you have also done things for which you'd like to be forgiven. We all have, right? We've all made mistakes. We've all acted in ways that were maybe not in the highest good for everybody involved or maybe not appropriate. And so I think if we can, you know, really when we're trying to learn to forgive somebody else for something that they did, um, it's helpful for us to, to realize, well, we've done something like that. Maybe not to the same degree, but we've all done something for, we, for, for which we would like to be forgiven. And so I think if we can tap into that, it's a lot easier to start to work towards forgiving other people. Or another way you could do it is to, to feel the gratitude that you experienced when somebody did actually forgive you. Or, or even more importantly, if you ha um, have forgiven yourself, right? That's another thing we have to pay attention to, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, so there's lots of ways to, 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 to kind of approach this. What is forgiveness? I guess I should have started with that. So forgiveness simply is, um, again, it's a little bit difficult to define, but I'd say it's the intention, the sincere intention to not seek um, revenge or to avoid the transgressor and replace negative emotions with positive emotions. And of course, forgiveness is going to counteract those stress responses that we talked about before. Forgiveness will lower anxiety, decreased depression, lower levels of stress, and there's actually been evidence to show that it will lower blood cholesterol. Um, interestingly, forgiveness is also associated with lower self-reported illnesses. So things like pain, back pain specifically, back pain is one that's like, um, that's strongly associated with uh, mental emotional issues. Um, so people tend to experience less back pain. They have just a, a higher level of, of spiritual well-being. So I think it's important, right, to just learn to forgive. Not other people solely, but even more important, I think, for many of us to mention is that we must also be willing to forgive ourselves. We have to understand that we all do or say things that, or act in a way that we're not proud of, and, and that that's just part of being human. So instead of holding on to it, you know, we, we have to acknowledge it, right? But we can remember it, we can learn from it, and most importantly, we can let it go. And I'll tell you that I have um, worked with lots of people that, that on letting stuff go. And, I, and again, I, I don't want to um, belittle it and make it seem like it's easier to do than, that, and easier to, to, to do. And it's easy to do, I should say, and it's not easy to do, right? But it's, it's um, something that we all need to, we all need to, we all need to learn to do better, forgiving ourselves and forgiving. Because it's just the, the, the we are the people that pay, right? Cost, the cost is directly to our to us and to our health and to you know just our enjoyment in life all right so finally wrapping it up in terms of stress management and effective stress management around all of this stuff right so kind of like tying this all together i um i think that we really need a fe the feeling of life that should say life not live of life having a purpose of integrity rather than despair. Um, th these kinds of things are really invaluable in times of stress. So effective stress management serves as an emotion-focused and problem-focused coping technique, helping us to be more accepting of those things that are beyond our control. Also allows us the opportunity to collaborate with other people in the pursuit of common goals, right? And again, that's where this like community, spiritual community or religious groups might come in. So um, as I was doing a little bit of reading, I, I kind of came across um, some of the work of Eric Erickson, who's a pretty famous um, psychiatrist. 
And basically what he, he was saying was that um, as we age, lots of these things or this or a lot of I should say a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about really kind of comes to the forefront as we age. And um, he was saying that believing your life is not an isolated event will be one of the, the biggest developmental tasks of our later years. And he said that the biggest challenge that faces challenge that faces elderly people is to resolve what he called the crisis between integrity and despair. And when this is resolved, people feel connected to um, what came before them and what will come after them. So they sort of feel as if they've, you know, made a contribution to the cycle of life and that therefore their life ultimately had purpose and ha has had purpose and meaning. And he said that this is the definition of spiritual health. And for some people, I think religious beliefs provide this. It's a belief that God and the afterlife is a reward for good deeds done in this lifetime. For other people, um, this comes, the spiritual health comes from a belief that all things are connected. And for other people, this, this spiritual health comes from, from being of service. You know, maybe um, for living a life where they've done a lot of service-oriented work or volunteerism. Again, it, I think what it all comes down to is make, he's giving people a, a place and, and meaning. You know, and, and that seems to be what, you know, as I said in the previous lecture, and of course it's my opinion, but I seem to think like that's what people are lacking and that's what we're all kind of craving. Um, so this is a book that's a great book that I, or um, they made, it was a book and then they made a special out of it um, by a gentleman named Mark Gaff. And um, the special was called Soul Prince. And um, basically, he just, it says basically that having faith does a lot, goes a long way in helping us, it goes, goes a long way in helping us live soulful and happy lives. And it doesn't necessarily need to be faith, it doesn't have to be faith in God, although for some people that works, faith in some higher power, faith in yourself, faith in another human, just having faith in something. So Mark, this gentleman, Mark Gaffney, um, you know, he basically kind of laid out that soul prints, which is what he called them, which I thought I think is such a cool term, phrase. Soul prints are unique stories of people, their reason for being, their views of the holy and, and um, of holistic living, the, the unique patterns of their individual spirits. So that's their story of it, basically. And um, he said that when people are not living their story, they have spiritual disease. And then ultimately that spiritual disease can result in psychological or physiological. So it's pretty interesting. You might want to look into his, to his work. All right, so I want to finish with um, what, what is called the four processes that nurture the human spirit. So basically, there's these four common themes that run through all spiritual paths and sort of find these themes. These are the common bonds of human spirituality, and there's different ways to view them. But in this particular approach, we view them as cycles or seasons. I think I, I like to think of them as, as the, I like that equates to the season because I think it's something that we can all relate to. So the first season of season, season excuse me, of course, is autumn. Um, which we call the the first um, process. The first process uh, lines, aligns with the, with the season autumn, and the first process is called the centering process. And basically, during autumn, and I think if you, as I'm, you might actually want to kind of look at the picture while I'm talking to you about them, um, and sort of try to get into the headspace of the seasons. Right? We, we, I think everyone in the class lives in California, but most of you are living in Northern California, so you definitely have, um, you know, pretty defined seasons. So when you think of autumn, um, we think of a time for um, soul searching. It's so before I post it, a time for soul searching, a time for centering our thoughts. According to Jung, 
um, this would be the time to access the power of the unconscious. So you might want to think, I'm going to put a discussion post for you guys to choose as a season and, and answer a question. So you, if, if autumn is your thing, um, you might think of what somebody could do during this cycle to center or to connect with the unconscious. There's not a right or wrong answer. It's sort of a practice. The second season, of course, is going to be winter. And the process of winter is empty. So this is the conscious process of letting go of thought, perceptions, and frustrations to make room for new insight. Winter is a time when we clear and we clean and we release the thoughts and perspectives that no longer fit you, where you fit who you are. This can be the most painful process because in reality, it's like a death of the old and make, make room for the rebirth that happens in the spring. So the question here would be, what could an individual do in this cycle to empty? The third, of course, season is going to be spring. Spring is aligns with the grounding process, right? This is the planting process that quickly follows the emptying or the however. Now the individual has space for new insight and perspectives. They've let go of the old during the winter and they're a lot there's new there's room for new stuff. This cycle includes intuitive answers to life's questions, a new sense of purpose, be, uh, a rebirthing, if you will, a new feeling to the world, and it includes the ability to feel comfortable in yourself and your environment. This can include letting go of the tension between the conscious and the unconscious. So what could an individual do in this cycle to ground? And then finally, we have the summer, our final season. Summer is the connecting process. So with the, um, according to Joan, um, Borsenko, she describes this cycle as related to centering, emptying, and grounding oneself. So this is the cycle, and I think we all kind of feel this as summer comes on. This is the cycle that includes social well-being. This is the time for celebrations with family and friends. It's the time to realize that it really is a small world after all. We really are all connected. In other words, we during this connecting process, we can start to see our the importance of our connections and feel a part of the connection to something bigger than ourselves when we might not have been able to understand before. So our question here is, what could an individual do in this cycle? So I'm going to put a discussion post where you can answer those questions. And again, there's no right or wrong, right? It just gives you a, it gives you a sort of a moment to you know, to touch into your own spirituality and how and or religion, however that works for you, and and start to kind of draw connections between spirituality slash religion and stress. And I'm also posting a video for you this week from. Um, I was going to write a little bit more, um, but instead I decided to post a um, a video discussion um it's just a youtube video and it is um kind of about the facets of spirituality in regards to stress management and um a guy by the name of brian it's brian brian seward um he's another kind of a psychological kind of a guy um who who really um has done a lot of work with this topic, um, just where spirituality meets stress or, or vice versa. And so it's only, it's like a 20 minute video and I, I found it to be really pretty interesting. So that's up for you this week as well. And um, I'm gonna write it, I'll put it. So I think that's all I have for you this week. Um, I look forward to seeing your discussions and I will be back next week. Next week I'm going to talk to you 
about a couple things. I'm going to talk about, I think I'm going to talk about meditation next week, but I'm also going to talk about some, some sort of practical, you know, um, interventions for stress, you know, like some, maybe some herbs and some different remedies that can be safely used um, in times of stress. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that next. All right, guys, talk to you soon. Have a great week.